So hello and welcome to a Renegade Economist talk show. Here we are at Picnic in Amsterdam. It's 2012 and I'm delighted to be joined with By by Byron Rees, who's the Chief Innovation Officer at Demand Media and has just given a scintillating uh, speech, uh, which you originally called uh, the untethering. Uh, can you just talk a, a bit about what untethering is? Well, it used to be that uh, before you were born, pretty much all the major life decisions you were going to make had already been made for you because there was this set of kind of social norms that that you were expected to, to just kind of follow. In fact, you probably didn't even think about them. And they were relating to, you know, education and marriage and religion and your occupation and, and all these th- these things that if you kind of deviated from the norm, you earned either the spoken or unspoken disapproval of society. And that what has happened is that recently uh, we, we have started to become untethered. We, uh, basically, we're now able to make decisions, fundamental decisions about our own life in a way we couldn't before that wouldn't have been socially or techn- technologically possible. And so what it means, if you if you stop and think about it, it means that for the first time, instead of who you are being answered with a list of circumstances, who you are is now a, a decision or a choice. In, the, um, in your slides, you use the analogy of an elephant. Just talk us through it. So... When a, when a baby elephant is captured in the wild, to domesticate the animal, they, they take a, a rope or a chain and they tie the, the baby elephant to the tree. And of course, the baby elephant doesn't particularly appreciate that. And it pulls and tries to tugs, and tries to get away, but it can't. And so an interesting thing happens. It stops trying. And then when the elephant is fully grown and could snap the tree like a twig, it has learned it, it can't. And so it doesn't even try. And so it remains tethered. And I think what's interesting about the analogy is that, is that although the world is becoming more untethered, we don't necessarily make great use of it. We still seem to live our lives as if you know, we're tethered, unaware, or at least not unaware, but refusing kind of to make basic uh, decisions for our, for our life. Like I was sitting next to somebody here at Picnic, and he was an American living, living here. And I said, how did you happen to move to Amsterdam? And he said, well, I realized I was living in the city I was living in because I was born there. And so I got a big spreadsheet out. I treated it like any other consumer decision. And I, I looked at all the major cities of the world and I chose this as the best for me and I moved here. And it's like that's the untethering kind of manifesting itself. So in a sense, it's a great awakening. I mean, because you're an ardent optimist, right? Because you, I mean, your, your book coming out is entitled... Um, infinite progress. So yes, it's how, uh, how the internet and technology will end ignorance, disease, poverty, hunger, and war. And I wouldn't necessarily say a great awakening, it's a great empowering. Uh, It isn't like in 1930 you would have been able to to consider yourself untethered. You you know, in in 1960, in 1970, you know, you could start to see it it forming. Uh, But what what now you are seeing is through the the power, the transforming power of technology, it enables more things. And then even even purely non-technical institutions like marriage or family or government, uh, are, are indirectly, tertiarily uh, affected by this because, you know, when, when you live in a world where everything's changing around you, you tend to view everything as changeable. And so you start looking at that and saying, well, why is it that way? And why is that that way? And why is that that way? And you start rethinking the world. So that kind of inquiring mind, if we just do this experiment, thought experiment, where we think, well, 10 years from now, a decade from now, 2022, right? What, when we look back at this interview, this day, this time in our history, what's your view on how we'll view it? Um, I, I think we stand at the cusp of a great new golden age. And I believe that because in the past, very few people had this luxury, this gift of being able to kind of chart their own way in life and make, make choices for themselves. And, and it was people who either had great ability or great... Um, birth, you know, uh, advantageous birth. And, and what happened is you, you got, with relatively few people being able to kind of, to, you know, you, you got Michelangelo and you got Mozart. I mean, you got all of these, this kind of flowering of, of humanity. And so when you imagine, what if everybody on the planet had, had that power over their own life to make decisions for themselves? And when, as I, as I said, every, every uh, Dante can write his Inferno and every Da Vinci can paint his Mona Lisa, you can only like look forward with with great hope and expectations of just all the possibilities uh, that that will have for the planet. And that kind of uplift, you think, will nullify a lot of the negative effects. But hey, let's not be too panglossian. The point is, we are going to have to go through some bad stuff first. Is that not the case? Well, I, I think 
it would be, it's easy to lose sight of what we've accomplished. You know, in 10,000 years of, of history, we have, um, you know, we've ended the legal protection, at least, of slavery. We have raised the, the legal status of women almost everywhere. We've ended torture for entertainment, you know. We've ended gladi gladiator battles. We've ended debtor's prison. We've invented habeas corpus, trial by jury, uh, evidentiary rules. I mean, we have had an unending amount of progress, and then you get to this point, and all of a sudden, everybody gets this hand-wringing pessimism of, okay, now it's all going to start getting worse. And that is without precedent. That is historically without precedent. Now, what, the way we got that way, the way we were able to progressively, I think, advance civilization was by dealing with all the hard challenges and all the, the hard issues as they came up. And so it's always easy to look at the cases where we're, we're failing and, and think that's the, the story. The big story is you know, we are, we are progressing and, and, you know, we have so much more left to do, but the trend line is pointing in a good direction, I believe. It's always nice uh, to have an optimist. It's too uh, easy, is it not, to read all the cynicism in the newspapers and the kind of mainstream media. Um, so thanks for, the, for your optimism. Also, thanks for your words. Um, and, and keep this message, I suppose, pumping around the world because it will resonate, I'm sure, with lots of people. Well, thank you very much. You know, there are two kinds of, of, of optimists. There's people who just kind of are you know, just no matter what the facts are, they're just like, oh, well. But then there are people who, who actually just can look at history and look at the world and, and make a, um, a decision. And my book opens with a quote from J. Craig Vintner, which is, I don't know if the pessimists or optimists are right, but I know this, it's the optimist who will get something done. And, and I think optimism, if it spurs you to action, is, is, is the best force for good around. Byron, thank you so much for your time. Uh, that's it from uh, Picnic with the Renegade Economist and Byron Reese. Bye-bye.